maybe it's time we stopped freeloading. Maybe it's time we moved out of our parents' basement. Maybe it's time we had a shower and got a job and started paying for stuff. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am Sergio Maldonado, and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy, and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands, and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity, or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, 10 years or more, but we're patient and we're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Hello again, we have John Marshall today, He's the author of Free is Bad, a book that you may have heard of, which I really enjoyed, published in late 2020. John believes the web can be a powerful tool that delivers quality services while still respecting our privacy. His career is very interesting. He's a serial digital marketing entrepreneur, founder of ClickTracks, one of the first web analytics tools, and even the first distance learning training courses in digital marketing. But let's jump into it with John Marshall. Hello, John. Really nice to see you again. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. Nice to see you again, Sergio. Uh, We'll start with something that may sound even silly, but that's always an an easy way to start. Um, the, uh, The graphics in your book, I really liked how you managed to cut through the complexity behind many of the concepts that you discuss. And uh, those childish sort of cartoon-like uh, graphics, they they somehow reminded me, they do a great job, and, and they reminded me of ClickTracks, uh, your former company and the, the one I, I knew you from. And I seemed to remember that you were keen, or your team was keen, on using similar tools to explain an equally complex environment, uh, web analytics. Is there a pattern of some sort in there? That's right. That, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right, Sergio. Um, with click tracks, what I learned was that um, the whole problem with web analytics was very abstract. It was very difficult for people to understand that in these charts and graphs and so on, you've got actual people coming along. So we, we wanted to show that somehow so we called him the blue guy right that sort of round head and the lego figure almost um so we we came up with that concept because it was a way for the user of the software to more easily understand what's going on and what i realized with this book is it's the same problem you've got these very abstract things how do you how do you make this more concrete for somebody and i realized that what i need is very high quality illustrations. Um, and I was very lucky to get um, Manuel on the job because he's enthusiastic and it just worked out really well. But it's it's the same problem. Abstract, abstract stuff. How do you make that concrete for people? Okay. So diving then into the substance of free is bad. You have worked pretty hard at simplifying the specific history of every piece of technology having an impact on the world we have found ourselves in today with the resulting challenges that you address. Now, those sort of storylines for search, for for news, for mobile phones, did you feel that you had to go that far back for readers to understand that what we have today was not in any way the most straightforward path? Um. What I, that, 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 that's basically the case. Um, what I found was um, where, where we are now, if we, if we look at where we are now, and let's just take one simple um, service online that we use every day. So the book deals with multiple services, you know, search, email, um, phones, all this kind of stuff. Let's just start with the simple one of um, uh, email, right? It's, it's a very simple thing. So um, Gmail, of course, just completely dominates use of email. Um, And it is free. 
And why is that? I mean, if you if you ask yourself that question, if you just if you just you can come up with a very trivial answer. I mean, if you say to somebody on the street, why is email free? Um, that they will tell you, well, because of advertising. I mean, everybody knows that. But there are actually much sort of deeper reasons why it's free. There are, it turns out there are historical reasons why it's free. And it, it, it's almost true to say that it's free because we refuse to pay for it. We've sort of grown up in this world where it is expected that this stuff be free. And I just want, I did, that just puzzled me as a, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, I just thought, look, what does that look like? Why, how is this business with its sales force and with everything else that's, you need inside a business? How are these businesses operating? What decisions are they making? Um, when the consumer is under the assumption that it must be free. And I, as, I, as I explored that, I realized that, um, for example, email is, email started out being free. It, I mean, if, actually, if you, if you really go back to the, the, the beginnings of email, the, it, it, before um, advertising driven, you know, before Gmail, email was this thing that you got with your ISP account. And, and they gave you an email account because it was just one of those things that you needed in order to, I don't know, you know, be online, I suppose. And that was just really interesting. So, so, we, so we, we sort of started with this entrenched view that email must be free. And that therefore made it very difficult for anybody to charge money for it. And that therefore made it necessary for there to be an ad supported email. So we, we, we started out with the assumption it needs to be free. And then the businesses needed to adapt to the choices that we were making as consumers. That, so that's why I thought, well, there's some history here. We, we need to spend a little bit of time explaining that history. Okay. Do you perceive a polarization between the pro privacy camp in some cases, uh, taking a pretty extreme stance when it comes to assuming a complete lack of ethics or an outright will to spy on people uh, on the part of you know, ad tech and, and, and marketing. And the marketing technology world or even the business world in some cases trying to make the point that they did not plot to be evil and others even speaking of privacy fundamentalism. I believe you've appreciated uh, in your book when talking about publishers that they need to make a living and that selling ad inventory, rectangles, as you say in your book, with all its consequences, was the natural way to assimilate the new medium. What do you think? Yeah, the, the, the way the media developed, um, I found that very interesting, actually. Um, and you, you, you see that media companies have um, adapted to the internet based on where they came from, what, what their origin was. So if you look at um, TV companies, um, they, they act online in a, in a way that continues with TV and radio. And the interesting thing about TV and radio is that you can only have that be free. I mean, right, broadcast TV and broadcast radio, it is, it is technically impossible for it to be anything other than free to everybody. I mean, that's just like the way the electromagnetic waves work. It just has to be free. So consumers of that, again, have the expectation that it be free. I mean, it's right. It was free in the 50s. It was free in the 70s. It was right. It changed a teeny little bit with cable, but not much. Right. It was just a little tweak around the edges. On the other hand, newspaper companies, there, the medium, it's very difficult for it to be free. I mean, just the cost of production, it, it, you know, the, it doesn't scale. You sort of got some free newspapers, but not really. So newspapers came in with the idea that they were already charging. So they, they, they had a completely different approach to how they tried to adapt what they were doing to then, you know, the expectations online. And of course, TV stuff could make it work online because they already were used to free, but the technology wasn't there. 
so they didn't work it didn't work very well for them and then newspapers well they also made their stuff free but that wasn't natural to them because with the newspapers they were charging so they kind of didn't really figure it out either they they neither of them really got it straight and i think i think now actually it's starting to shake out i mean i'm i'm seeing some things happening with um media companies that i'm very pleased about and one of those is just simply the growth of subscriptions i mean you know despite what my philosophy is with this stuff and the title of the book just says it all right i am of the opinion that free is bad i just there's just like no way around it um but growth in subscriptions of newspapers online is accelerating right people are buying subscriptions to newspapers because there kind of doesn't seem to be another way there doesn't seem to be something else that really works okay you have been sharing the media bias chart that sort of positions every outlet in a quadrant based on political views okay look at that <laughs> you do love it you have a poster of it of course uh, the the a BuzzFeed CEO was interviewed recently and said something along these lines. There will always be room for free news if people cannot afford to subscribe to a medium that conforms to their views. And the manner in which publishers, such as the New York Times, have been leaning farther towards the views of their prevailing subscriber base seems to agree with that view. Is it possible that the more neutral, bias-free media needs to be free? Perhaps some sort of public service, as Mr. Peretti seems to advocate, pretty much like the BBC. I am. Um, I, I, I try to be agnostic about bias. You know, one of the things that I um, I try to avoid in the book um, is discussion of bias and whether this publisher is biased in this way or that publisher is biased in another way. Um, I think I think bias is a is a maybe bias is something that I don't understand enough and it's not it's not um, a topic where I feel qualified. The the the, the part of um, the media bias chart from um, from Vanessa Otero, right? Ad Fontes Media, huge fan. I mean, she's just she's just a superstar. Um, the I'm more interested really in the vertical axis of that chart, which is quality. So the horizontal axis is bias, and the vertical axis is quality. And I I try to I try to um, stick to the vertical axis. Now, I'm I think I'm taking a I'm going to take a, a fairly unpopular position with um, media publishing. And I'm going to say that um, the problem of who pays is always going to drive the way that media businesses operate. And I just don't see a way around that. And uh, there's really there's really two and a half different ways that media businesses get paid. There's really, right, there's subscribers, there's advertisers, which really means ad tech, and then there's a public option, and that's the half. <laughs> there's, that's it. I don't, I don't see, I don't see any other way. So a media business that is entirely dependent on ads, I think that pushes that media business to do certain things and behave in certain ways. And a media business which is dependent on subscribers operates in a different way. And I certainly respect the idea, and, and, a, and a, 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 a media publisher, if they were in this call, would probably be getting pretty irate at this point with me. Um, but that I, I certainly respect the idea that media is a public service, you know, that, that, that it, it fulfills an important role in democracy. Um, but in that case, that's where that half comes in. And that's where the, 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 the public option is, it, it fulfills that need. Um, if I can, I'm gonna really push things a little bit and I'm gonna use an analogy and I'm gonna probably make myself even more unpopular. <laughs> In the same way that everybody has a right to information, 
Uh, in the same way, I think everybody has a right to food. I don't want to see anybody starve and I don't want to see anybody go without information. But I personally am not going to go and eat at my local soup kitchen. It's just not something that I'm going to do. I'm going to pay as much money as I reasonably can for food. And I'm going to pay as much money as I reasonably can for information. I've just never seen anything in life. I've never seen anything in life where quality was not proportional to the price that I pay. And I know that's a little unpopular, uh, but I'm sorry, that's me. I'm just seeing, I'm just looking inside the businesses that operate here. And I think I'm better off being the customer and I'm better off paying extra for organic food. And I make that choice and somebody else doesn't want to do that and they pay less money and that's their choice. And there's somebody else who really can't afford anything and they rely on a food bank or a soup kitchen. All of those are valid. But if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably in that organic food category. So I think you should be paying for your facts. I don't see a way around it. And as you say, you are what you eat. <laughs> okay, and what do you think are the, the consequences or the bad consequences of free media for the other side, for advertisers? This is, this is a complicated problem. Um, I think I came to the book, I mean, perhaps we should explain uh, by way of background that of course I'm an ad tech entrepreneur. I mean, I think if you simplified my career to a couple of words, that's what you would say. Um, and, you know, the original um, entry point that I had to that world uh, was, um, you know, an analytics tool for getting metrics and so on, particularly for small business. I mean, the, the price point of that product and the, the way we developed it and sold it, it was really meant for, for small businesses. Um, so I, I, I have tremendous affinity because of my experience there for small business. And in fact, every product If, if we think that there were three ad tech companies in there, each one of those products was really aimed at small business. And I think that's because I have an affinity for small businesses and I understand them more easily than I do big businesses. I think that's the way my brain works. Um, and I found ad tech to be tremendously helpful for small businesses and online advertising worked great for small businesses. I just like can't get away from that reality, no matter how much it makes me uncomfortable. I think actually, at least up until maybe the last few years, ad tech really worked well for small businesses and it enabled them to compete against big businesses. Um, it has got a lot more complicated in the last three, four years. Um, And I am more ambivalent about it now, and I'm not sure it does work so well for small business. So, Sergio, I think to, to refine the question, we maybe need to look at differences between small businesses and big businesses. Um, big businesses definitely have more problems, I think. The amount of money that sloshes around just makes it such that the waste and other problems are much more acute. Um, small businesses... I think you can still run a targeted campaign on Facebook or something like that. And I think it works well. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to complain too much about that. You went all the way back to the origin of banners, double click and so on. And, um, and I really think that is essential. There was once an internet without cookies. Um, you help us realize that this was never part of the original plan, which helps us picture potential alternative worlds where we may have ended up and the solution may be in that exercise. Is there anything that you have discovered through the thought process that goes into writing the book as a new vision on where we should go next as a solution to the current mess? That is, a, um, that is the wish of all wishes. Um, I think... 
there were two things, there were two little pieces of knowledge, maybe, maybe more than two, but anyway, I had these little pieces of knowledge um, about what the, what the precursor thinking to the internet was um, that I think are really telling. Uh, and I think they're useful because um, they're, they're, little, they're thoughts that were made by people way smarter than me. Right, so there were, there, you know, a couple of really intelligent people had thought about what could happen, and had um, made plans and statements that could indicate where we could end up. Um, and it, it, I am giving away something here, but it doesn't matter. Okay, the pod, the, the, the podcast exists to help people and make the world a better place. So the first thing is. The guy who invented hypertext and hyperlinks, right? I mean, it's not, it's not Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He got that idea from Ted Nelson and Ted Nelson with Project Xanadu. Now I know about Project Xanadu, I actually read about it in Wired in like 1994, 93, I can't remember, but so Ted Nelson, Project Xanadu, he, he, he's worth just Googling that, research it and, he knew that um, information wants to be expensive. Now, the, the internet has this phrase, information wants to be free, and everybody says that. But that was actually the other smart guy. That was um, Stuart Brand. And in, Stuart, in, in, in 1984, Stuart Brand said, information wants to be expensive. Information also wants to be free. There's more to it than that, but that's the essence of it. Ted Nelson knew that as well. And so he built into Xanadu the idea of micropayments. And micropayments so that as you consume content, you pay for that content. Tim Berners-Lee didn't bother with that. He just like skipped it, right? Uh, you know, I can't be bothered with that. I'm an academic who really cares about that. That's just... Uh... It is a good point. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee coming from academia, gave us a framework to share documents in a smart way, but the web was never built as a framework for applications. And cookies were required to solve the statelessness, as we call it, the statelessness of the web, or the fact that every HTTP request is isolated from those happening before and after, as you of ClickTrack's fame know very well. But on the other hand, Ted Nelson did think of such a world. Are we on time? to go back to that sort of hippie dream, rebuild the internet without the constraints that took us to an overstretched environment where all sorts of problems proliferate. I've spent so much time thinking about this and I spent um, a lot of time um, you know, researching uh, products and technologies and concepts and uh, um, things, you know, um, privacy cloud and, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole world there of how do we make the web work better? And the fundamental problem is, um, I think people who are attempting to make the web work better, which is a shorthand way of saying, you know, privacy is better and a bunch of things get fixed, you know. Um, they, they, they seem to be coming from the, the problem, from the point of view that um, we made mistakes in the original design. And so we can now go back and fix those mistakes. And I just don't see it that way. The web was not, it was not, you know, mistakes in the way that ads were designed. I mean, that is just not true. The web was just simply never designed with the idea that there would be ads. <laughs> right? I mean, Tim, Tim Berners-Lee is not responsible for creating a crappy ad system. He, 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 just, he just did nothing. And completely by accident, there was this loophole that, you know, that created this whole thing with the third party cookies and third party data. I mean, it's all totally accidental. Um, so it's very hard to go back and, and fix these loopholes. Just, just ask 
anybody that works in taxation, for example, right, taxing stuff, every it always ends up in loopholes. I mean, particularly here in the U.S., right? The tax system in the U.S. is not even a system. It's a I don't know what it is. It's a it's a species. It's an Amazonian jungle. Um, it's the, these loopholes just become almost impossible to go back and patch. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable. So, so if we can't do it in taxation, where there's, I don't think we're going to be able to go back and patch this stuff um, on the web. So if, if you can't go back and patch it, um, the, you, you've somehow got to, I, I believe, I, I am of the opinion that you've somehow got to um, move the economic incentive and there are only two, maybe two and a half ways of dealing with, of paying for stuff online. Two and a bit. There's ads, there's subscriptions, and there's a public option. And that's the half, you know. So if we can't fix ads, this is where I, this is where I ended up with this not necessarily popular point of view, but I don't, I don't see a way around it. Paying for stuff as consumers is simple and transparent and elegant. We've just grown up not doing it, but maybe it's time we grew up. Maybe it's time we stopped freeloading. Maybe it's time we moved out of our parents' basement. Maybe it's time we had a shower and got a job and yeah. started paying for stuff. <laughs> It's a good point, yeah. Since you cannot fix it all, um, a way out is to remove the source of most of our problems, which is advertising. Um, okay, since we cannot build a parallel web, something that seems to have happened is the opposite. Let it all be and keep patching it up even farther with legislation. What does this world look like when you top it up with extensive privacy legislation? Yeah, yeah. Privacy legislation is is an interesting one. Um, I live in I live in California, and um, we have the um, CCPA legislation, right? It's a sort of like slimmed down GDPR, unique to California. Um, but California has also fairly uniquely within the U.S. We have this um, system of um, uh, putting, we call them ballot measures. So when it comes to election time, you've got these additional things on the ballot. It's sort of like um, Switzerland, you know, the way that in Switzerland, the referendum is very, very, it's like very integral to society. California is a bit like that. So we just had an election. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody knows that. And therefore in California, we had ballot measures and there was a ballot measure to make CCPA more strict. And I voted for it, right? There you go. I want more legislation. I am not ambivalent about the idea of legislation. You know, despite the idea, despite what may seem to be very um, laissez-faire attitudes from me, or even sort of ultra libertarian, which is not quite true. Um, I actually think legislation is good, and I applaud GDPR in Europe, and I want more of that. The difficulty is, if you put in place stricter legislation, that means that at the ads that you're dealing with that that could then that then can conform to that legislation, those ads are less valuable. I mean that that statement must be true because better targeted ads are more valuable. So less well targeted ads have to be less valuable. So that is going to choke off the money that goes to publishers. And I think that therefore forces publishers to find another way to make money. They could do that by having more sponsored content. I don't think that's a good thing. Sponsored content is sort of euphemism for fake news, right? They can do other unnatural acts behind the scenes. I don't think that's good. So what you're left with probably is consumers need to pay. I don't see a way around it. So I, I, I want the legislation. I'm not anti-legislation, I'm pro-legislation. 
But that's naturally going to take us to, I believe, I believe that's naturally going to take us to a place where consumers need to start paying more money because otherwise the publishers go away. Uh, John, can you tell us about the TLDR version of your book? Yes, indeed. Um, when I started my project to write the book, um, my goal was a, to be about 250 pages. Um, so I was finished. I was really surprised that it's 340 pages. And I mean, it, it's a pretty, it is a pretty well-paced read, but the harsh reality is that's just too much for plenty of people. There's plenty of people who want to improve their experience online. Um, millennials would be a great example. And I don't see them grinding through um, 350 pages of exceptionally well-written and fast-paced <laughs> copy, right? Not gonna happen. So I'd always planned an abridged version and that is free is bad, TLDR, um, meant for millennials and uh, college age people. Um, it's around about 80 pages and it's very, very fast paced and it, it gives a little bit of the history, but it skips that. Um, I am making the somewhat radical decision that the Kindle version of that will be free. But free is bad. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, I, it, there's something that's just so funny about that that I kind of can't resist it. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, okay, how do we wrap it up? Any final thoughts? Um, I want to, I do, I want to make the world a better place. I mean, that is, has been my starting point with the whole thing. Um, I didn't want to sort of end my business career. I'm, I'm semi-retired. I didn't want to end my business career and my career in ad tech with, I built up all of this knowledge. I've got like, I, I saw all of this stuff develop. I saw the way the world became what it is. And I think I know where it's going to go, or at least a little bit. I have a sense of that direction and just, walk away from that. I didn't feel good about that. So if I want to explain to some people why this stuff is the way it is, and maybe what you can do about it, once you've started on that journey, trying to get money back out of that, it doesn't feel right. It just feels like I can just give this thing away and it's all good. Very good. John, thank you very much. Sergio, thank you. Okay, that's all for today. Please find episode notes and links to our social channels and other feeds on mastersofprivacy.com. Please do not give us five stars on your favorite podcasting channel unless you believe there is no more room for improvement. Your candid feedback is probably more useful to us. Thank you.